Derek Jensen <laughs> is a prolific author who has written a bunch of influential books, including A Language Older Than Words, Culture of Make Believe, Endgame, and more recently, Deep Green Resistance, which we do have for sale in the lobby as well. Um, Derek speaks widely about many things, including how to take down civilization. <laughs> and uh, he is joining us via video, and he just got back from the doctor. So welcome, Derek. <laughs> And um, uh, of course, it's what 4:35 here, and my doctor's appointment was at three. But any of you who have ever been to doctors know that that means that, and the doctor's office is about ten minutes from here. So a doctor's appointment at three means I'm really lucky to get out of there at 4:35. You know? Um, okay. Um, I also, I obviously have to apologize if anything I say replicates what was said before, because I have no idea what was said before. Um, <laughs> And then, okay, let me know correctly if, if this, I mean, I'm supposed to be talking about um, the question of resistance to oppression and uh, questions of violence or nonviolence. Is this, is this I mean, somewhat accurate? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what what sorts of strategies and tactics have do you believe have been effective, or that or do you practice, um, and would you recommend that uh, Occupy you know consider as we move forward? Well, I think I would like to start by mentioning a few um, either. Well, I would like to start by mentioning a few things that I think we should take as self-evident. And one of them is that the planet is being murdered. 200 species are extinct today, and 200 will go extinct tomorrow, and 200 will adapt to that. And, and they're, they are my brothers and sisters. And I think something else that's very important is to recognize that power is not a mistake. And those in power won't change because we act nicely. And I think we should also recognize that underlying patriarchy and underlying the dominant culture, it's like Mary Daly says, there's only one religion in the world right now, and it's patriarchy. And underlying patriarchy is a drive to violate it. That one of the ways, and this is, this is cultural and not biological, one of the ways that men within patriarchy have their masculinity validated is by declaring some other to be other and inferior and then violating this other. So white people can be superior and can declare people of color to be inferior and therefore viable. And men can be superior and declare women to be inferior and therefore viable. And it is through this very violation that their masculinity is, is validated and also reaffirmed in terms of if I can violate this other, then the other must be inferior. And there are many problems with this, one of which, of course, is on the planet, another of which is that it's horribly immoral. And another problem is that there's a great line by Artie Lang, which is that how do you fill a void filling a void? And the point is that they're trying to validate their existence and their identity through violation. That's not really how our, our, our identity is supposed to be validated, and so they're not really validating anything. And besides which, there are always others who can't be validated, I'm sorry, who can't be violated, and therefore it's insatiable, which is one reason that the United States has bombed the moon. And this is one reason they have to send probes to the deepest hole of the ocean. Everything must be violated. Okay, I say all this is a preamble, 
Because I think one of the things that's really central to my work is the understanding that the problems that we have to face are not fundamentally rational, and therefore they cannot be solved through rational discussion. Um, slavery was stopped by, by, by people simply, well, slavery has been stopped. But as far as it has been stopped, it hasn't been stopped by people simply saying, wow, that's a really bad moral idea. Um, and so my point is that those in power only understand force. And that does not mean they only understand violence. It means that, I mean, I think probably most of the people in this room have heard of Team Sharp, and they know that if you have the numbers, you can accomplish great change through purely nonviolent means. But you still have to understand force. Because it's negative capitalism is cheap to not serve capital is a bad bet when the planet is hanging in the balance. So, far as what I believe we need, I believe the first thing we need to do is to start asking ourselves what we want. And then, because I don't think we do a really good job of that. And and then I think we need to start thinking strategically. So if what we want is, is, is A, then we need to accomplish B. And a great example of this is if you ask any reasonably intelligent 10-year-old how you stop global warming that's caused the great magnitude by the burning of oil and gas, the 10-year-old will tell you, stop burning oil and gas. <laughs> <laughs> and if you ask a reasonably intelligent 35-year-old, works for a high-tech, green high-tech consulting firm, how you stop global warming and cause a great measure of burning oil and gas, and give me an answer that it has to do with, that, that will help the, the, the high-tech consulting firm. And how much time do I have left? <laughs> like Eric, you, no, you have about eight minutes left. Okay. Um, <laughs> So, I think we need to ask ourselves first what it is we want and whether what we want is possible. So, I mean, I'm very clear on what I want, which is I want to live in a world that has more wild sand than ever you do before, and more migratory songbirds. And I want to live in a world where there is less dioxin every year in every mother's breast milk, and there's less plastics in the ocean. And so the first step toward having less dioxin in every mother's restaurant, you would think, would be to stop the production of toxic chemicals which lead to the dioxin in every mother's restaurant. And if I were the if I were in charge of things, I could simply order this by fiat, but I'm not. And <laughs> And those in power have not shown themselves amenable to stopping. So the question becomes, how do we stop them? And I think that something that's really helped me to reframe the problem we face is to recognize what so many indigenous people have said to me, which is the first and most important thing for us to do is to decolonize our hearts and minds, to separate ourselves from the system and to not identify with the system. And one way that I think about this is to think of space aliens that come down from outer space and they were systematically deforesting the planet and they were vacuuming the oceans. 90% of the large fish in the oceans are gone and there are solid scientists who are saying the oceans could be devoid of fish in 50 years. And our response is what? To carry science? To write books? And if space aliens were doing this, we would know what to do, which is to take out the infrastructure that allows the aliens to do this. And 
Another way to say this is that one of the problems with a lot of the Asian environmentalists is that all of the so-called solutions, global warming, for example, take industrial capitalism as a given. And the natural rule is that which must conform to industrial capitalism. And they say explicitly, they're, they're attempting to save civilization. But it is civilization itself that is killing the planet. This is kind of like saying, we're trying to figure out how we can save Ted Bundy. And it's really crucial, I think, that we take a step back. And that's why I say it's really important to figure out what we want. Because if what we want is to figure out a way to have computers and, uh, and jet skis and retractable stadium roofs, <laughs> modern industrialized medicine, and at the same time have a planet, you can't. You can't consume a planet and have it too. So the first thing, it's like a doctor friend of mine says, the first step for diagnosis, the first step for cure is proper diagnosis. And now having said that we need to, um, that if these were space aliens, we would take out the infrastructure that allows them to wage war against the planet and wage war against the poor. I also need to say that sometimes I get pegged as a violence guy, and I don't like that very much because it's not accurate. And what I really am is the everything guy. Because I want to point out that only 2% of the IRA ever picked up weapons. And it's definitely important for us to build a resistance movement. And that resistance movement includes things like Occupy, it includes those things of what they're doing. And in addition, I think we need to start thinking strategically. To go back to what I said before about understanding force, I, would, I think that Occupy, if I were to be able to give advice to Occupy, it would be to move beyond symbolic occupation and move toward occupations that significantly impair the functioning of the economic machine. The French did this 14 months ago during their general strike in, in France. They did not simply occupy spaces, but instead they recognized that without the oil, there is no economy, and they moved to blockade oil terminals. And my whole point in that is that that's thinking strategically. So now I'm going to go back another direction and say that the line I'm probably most famous for, I wrote 13, 15 years ago. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote that line is because. <laughs> we miss Echo! Can you say it again? We missed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh. Uh, well, the most famous line I have is probably every morning when I wake up, I ask myself whether I should ride or blow up a dam. And did you get that line? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And one, one thing I was trying to get at with that line is the distinction between symbolic and non-symbolic actions. The writing a book is really important, or or holding a meeting, or acting in solidarity. All symbolic actions can be really important, but it's not actually a lack of symbolic actions to kill Sam. It's the presence of DMs. And so one thing I think is really important also is to recognize that symbolic actions are important, but they are still recruiting tools. And at some point, actual physical actions need to take place. And I guess I want to say one more thing, and then I'll, I'll wind up, which is that one thing that really offends me deeply is that I just got a note a couple of days ago. You know, I'm, I'm sure many of you know about the whole Chris Hedges hullabaloo with um, where I was interviewed about the Black Bloc, and I said that I thought the Black Bloc actions were unstrategic, immoral, and, un and untactical quite often. And I got a lot of attacks for doing that, including a death threat. And that kind of made my point. And, <laughs> and I got a note a couple days ago from somebody saying, what, are you saying that we can never be militant? And I just want to say that something I find really offensive is that 
the notion of throwing a rock through a window is what substitutes for militants. Well, I guess one person like this. <laughs> <laughs> the, the point I was attempting to make was not an attack against militants, but it's an attack against being stupid. <laughs> and, um, I guess the last thing I want to say is that, um, is that we're, we're, in, we're in Philadelphia, right? And you are in Philadelphia, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 And um, this is associated with Quakers, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to tell this story that I've told a bunch of times. Now, if, if, if this ends up apocryphal, then I will be sorely embarrassed. But it's a story I just desperately love about how the Black Panthers were looking for a place to hold a meeting. And they, I can barely say it's fine. They were looking for a place to hold a Congress. And, um, the Quakers, even though they themselves did not necessarily agree with the Panthers on the use of guns, um, <laughs> recognized that the they they allowed the Panthers to use their meeting house, and the reason they did this is because they knew, and then. They rigged it with their own bodies because they knew that the cops wouldn't kill white people to get it done. If we are to survive, and if we're to this wretched machine that is killing every kind of planet, we need that sort of solidarity between those who believe in different tactics. And we need to work together. And I guess that's what I'd like to end with. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. I'm kind of kidding. I'm kind of kidding, but if that story isn't true, don't tell me because it'll break my heart. <laughs> <laughs> Someone I trust just said that it is true. Yeah, so.